Las Vegas during the 1950s was experiencing a small boom in the opening of new casino projects on the Las Vegas Strip. Thanks to the help of the success of the El Rancho Vegas, new casinos such as the Dunes, the Desert Inn, the Sands, and the Hacienda were being built all across what would later be known as the Las Vegas Strip. The majority of these casinos would later become one of the most influential and legendary in the history of casinos. However, decades later they would all be imploded and demolished to make way for newer, more luxurious hotels and casinos, mainly due to their failure of being able to stay up within the crowd of new mega resorts in the 1990s and 2000s. Only one of these had managed to survive the string of implosions without having to radically remove the majority of its original look and that happens to be the Tiffany of the Strip itself, the Tropicana. This is the story of Las Vegas' only 1950s casino that has not been imploded. In 1955, a hotelier by the name of Ben Jaffe, previously known for being the executive and part owner of the Fountain Blue Hotel on the beaches of Miami, had purchased 40 acres of land on the south end of the famed Las Vegas Strip next to Bond Road, or Tropicana Avenue as it's known today. He had an idea to build his own resort and casino that would also be co-owned by Charles Barron, infamous for being an organized crime figure from Chicago. To help out in building the resort, Ben Jaffe hired Conquistador Incorporated, which was owned by none other than Phil Castle, another organized crime figure who owned the infamous illegal casino The Beverly Club in New Orleans, Louisiana. His experience with the illegal casino would help him envision the design for building the project with Jaffe, the Tropicana, an $8 million resort and casino that would be themed after the many hotels in the city of Havana in Cuba and would include 308 rooms, all themed after different parts of Europe, including ones based off of the Italian Renaissance and the French province. Groundbreaking of the resort took place in late 1955, with predictions of the place opening on June 1, 1956. M. Tony Sherman, an architect from Miami, helped to design the project, along with Taylor Construction Company of Miami, who took part in building. Another designer, Margaret Castell, would design the decor of the lobby and casino area. Problems arose during construction. At the same time the Tropicana was being built, another resort and casino, the Stardust, was also under construction on the opposite end of the Las Vegas Strip. This caused Jaffe to have trouble hiring workers within the area, and thus, he was soon short on cash. In order to keep the project going, he sold the Fountain Blue in Miami for $5 million. At a cost of $15 million, the Tropicana, becoming the most expensive Las Vegas resort at the time, officially opened for business on April 4th, 1957, being the 12th resort on the Las Vegas Strip to open in its history. Attending the grand opening was a ribbon cutting ceremony provided by Las Vegas Mayor at the time, C.D. Baker, Lt. Gov. Rex Bell, Eddie Fisher, and Debbie Reynolds. Festivities included the first show shown at the Tropicana, the Tropicana Review. This was a $250,000 musical that started Eddie Fisher, a popular American singer and actor. It also had its own original music, along with backdrops of the resort's heavy tropical theming. The Tropicana, which had the motto Tiffany of the Strip, created by publicist Harvey Daedrich, sat on 34 acres, a little bit smaller than the original 40 acres that were planned. Outside, the resort featured a giant 60-foot, tulip-shaped neon fountain in the center of a 100-foot diameter pool along with a porte cochere decorated with many different country flags on each side. The 300 rooms that it had were inside three separate wings, spread out in the shape of a Y in order to maximize its efficiency. Each room were air-conditioned, which was considered a luxury at the time, along with private terraces used for relaxing or sunbathing. The resort also contained a scalloped, Olympic-sized pool in the center of its courtyard area, surrounded by $80,000 floral gardens. Inside, the casino was covered in mahogany panels and contained ornamental decorations along with quote-unquote peacock alleys going from its front desk to its gambling tables. One of the restaurants featured inside the casino was the 450-seat theater restaurant, which gave guests a view of a rather large stage. This restaurant showcased stars including Eddie Fisher and business veteran Monty Proser, along with the previously mentioned Tropicana Review. The restaurant would later be changed to the Fountain Theater. 
Another restaurant was Perino's Gourmet Room, which was advertised to have regal service within the area known for its serving cocktails. That, and the nearby Brazilian Room, Showcase Lounge, and the Celebrity Room. The Tropicana during its early years would become a success, thanks to its support for veteran leadership. Some of the most notable workers at the hotel and casino at the time included Luis Lederer, who served as a secretary treasurer, the soft drink king of Chicago, T.M. Schimberg, and J.K. Housels, a former minor and U.S. Army Air Force pilot. Despite the success, the Tropicana would receive its first major incident involving the mob not even a year into operation. One of Phil Castle's friends happened to be Frank Costello, who just so happened to be a crime boss of the infamous Luciano crime family. On May 2, 1957, Costello was living in the lobby of an apartment house that he lived in when all of a sudden, he was shot in the head and wounded by a guy by the name of Vincent Giganti. During investigations by the police, it was found that the inside of a coat that Costello was wearing during the incident contained what is known as a gross whim from the Tropicana, dating April 27, 1957, with hundreds of thousands of dollars printed out. Costello survived the shooting with a head wound, although by that time, the incident had gained national news coverage. One thing to know about the gross one was that part of it was written by Luis J. Letterer, who happened to be a general manager of the Tropicana. Because of this, suspicions arose from the authorities, and thus Letterer was banned from the gaming industry. Later on after the incident in 1959, J.K. Housel, manager of the resort and casino, bought out the Tropicana, ending Jaffe's ownership of the building. At the end of the decade, the Tropicana would begin its first ever expansion, adding a new wing of hotel rooms bringing the room count up to 450. Also at that point, Eddie Fisher, who was performing at the resort's theater, was giving the Tropicana an intense attraction from visitors and tourists. In fact, the resort and casino would see a massive increase in celebrities, including Elaine Dunn, Sean Garrison, Kathy Crosby, George Chakoris, and more. On the downside though, Eddie Fisher's appearance at the Tropicana would only last for an incredibly short time, when in late 1959, the Desert Inn bought a 10-year contract for him to stay at the casino's showroom. This caused a major downfall for the short-lived elegance of the resort. By that time, several of the casinos on the strip had made new renovations, making their appearance look much more grand than the South End property. This would quickly be fixed, however, on the date of December 24, 1959, with the introduction of the Tropicana's most famous show in its entire history, the show that made Paris famous, Folies Bergère. Based off of the famous cabaret music hall in Paris, the show cost about $800 million to perform, and included 80 performers. Folies Bergère was a huge success for the resort, quite possibly the most successful in Las Vegas at the time, alongside the stardust Lido de Paris. It, in fact, made the Tropicana arise from its slow business that it had earlier the same year and became a rival for many of the Las Vegas Strip hotels. This would become the largest and longest running show the resort and casino would ever have. The resort and casino would expand once again, this time across the street in 1961 with the grand opening of the Tropicana Golf Course and Country Club. The golf course contained 18 holes and was spread out across 125 acres of land. A small country club would also be included within the golf course, containing a cocktail lounge and a coffee shop. This was followed by a new 160-room wing surrounding the pool about a year later in 1962, increasing the room count to 566. Another hotel addition was added in 1964 with a four-floor, 132-room hotel building located on the side of the Tropicana Avenue, including 12 new suites. The rest of the 1960s would see an ongoing increase in celebrity vegetation at the Tropicana, including Roger Williams, Mary Jane, Judy Kelly, The Three Cheers, and even Walt Disney. As the decade came to an end, Follies Bergere would see a $750,000 change, it was now 90 minutes, and would show twice nightly. The number of performances increased to 100, and was now produced by Michael Jarmuthy and Maynard Sloet. Along with that, Housels will sell the hotel and casino to Texas International Airlines, mainly due to it being the hotel and casino nearest to the McCarran Airport. However, the newly renovated show and ownership would not help see the survival of the glamour the Tropicana would see in the beginning of the 1970s. By the beginning of the 1970s, the Tropicana, which had previously been uplifted by the beauty of Follies Bergere, would see another drop in quality, only this time much harder. The Tropicana was heavily run down, and by 1971, 
a guy by the name of Deal Gustafsson was tired of the lack of quality within the casino. Thus, he bought out the building and planned on doing a $12.5 million expansion and renovation of the property. According to him, the Tropicana was in such dilapidated state that he called it, by quote, an old elephant that needed a stab in the rear. During this time, new casinos such as the International and Caesars Palace, along with already existing ones, were booming in popularity, showcasing many famous talents such as Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and many other famous celebrities. Even with the Follies Bergere, the Tropicana would not withstand the amount of entertainment other casinos and resorts on the Strip had. Desperate times called for desperate measures. In 1973, a new 1150-seat showroom called the Superstar Theater was built adjacent to the hotel, so they designed for one of the stars of Las Vegas, Sammy Davis Jr., along with other famous performers. The Tropicana became Davis's main showcase area for the rest of the 70s. Along with that came new ownership. Mitzi Stauffer Brings, the inheritor of the Stauffer Chemical Company, bought out an interest to the resort and casino in 1975. This time, she had decided that she wanted to actually do something with the resort, and thus, construction of a new hotel tower, then named the Tiffany Tower, began in 1977. Even then, that would not help the struggling resort and casino. By the heart of the decade, Gustafsson's planned renovation and expansion had already met the deadlines, and nothing had been done to do any of that. To add insult to injury, in 1978, the resort went under a money-skimming scheme by Joe Agosto, who owned the Follies Bergere at the time. He noticed that people from the Kansas City crime family were stealing money from the casino's cashier cage, and thus, the Tropicana was losing even more money from before. The money laundering scheme was exposed by the FBI, along with them exposing Agosto for managing part of the casino without a license. Because of this, Deal Gustafsson and Briggs were also revoked of their license. The skimming incident of 1978 would only force the mob out of business from the heavily struggling hotel and casino, and thus the building had to be forced to be sold out to Ramada Inns. Gone were the Tropicana's era of the mob, and the year began the era of the corporations. Not to mention the fact that by the beginning of the 1980s, the Tropicana was about to enter its largest set of expansions yet.